Her works have been compared to the fiction of Khalid Hosseini and Patricia McCormick. Her literature tackles the problems of war, pollution, the environment, immigration, and foreign affairs alongside the issues teenagers face in the Middle East. To date, Atia has won several writing and literary awards and has been named to the 2019 Tayshas with the Texas Library Association. At this time, I would like to turn the program over to Atia Abawi Powell. Hi, thank you so much, Tasha. It's such a honor uh, to be here today. Um, I'm so grateful for everyone who has decided to log in. Thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen at the moment. Um, let's see. That's, hopefully that is working and you're seeing the, the PowerPoint. Um, and I'm a foreign correspondent. Uh, that was my original career. And I, I have now shifted uh, towards uh, writing novels. Um, a little bit about myself to start with. Um, I am, well, I was born a refugee. Uh, my parents uh, were originally from Afghanistan. Um, and as you all know, Afghanistan right now for its many wars, and primarily most of you know it for the current war since it's been going on for nearly uh, two decades now. But my parents left during the first war of um, the last 40 years, and that was against the Soviet Union. And uh, my mom was actually eight months pregnant with me. And we first went to Germany because my dad actually, he went to the German school in Kabul from the age of five to 17. And so he spoke fluent German and um, that was the first stop. A lot of people don't know this about Afghanistan, but Afghanistan used to be a fairly cosmopolitan, at least the city of Kabul, the capital was a cosmopolitan city. Um, these are pictures of my family. Um, in fact, the pictures that you see of the women and the group of women, that's from the 1940s. And those are all my, that includes my grandmother, um, my aunts, uh, that was Kabul in the 1940s. It's not the pictures of the blue burqas that many of you know of Kabul now. Uh, my dad is there. He's that's a picture of him working as a journalist. He, in fact, was the one in the relationship who followed his dreams. And my mother, who's on the bottom with one of my older cousins, uh, she was the breadwinner of the family. And they were happy that way. My dad got to follow his dreams and my mom got to follow her dreams by being a successful accountant for the top airlines in Afghanistan. Um, a lot of people, when they think about Afghanistan, they think of oppressed women. Um, a lot of people who think about Syria think of war and rubble. They don't realize that Syria also, just a few years ago, less than a decade ago, was a, a cosmopolitan country. I mean, despite our governments not having relations, it was not a third world country. Um, it was a first world country. Unfortunately, war can change everything. Um, with a snap of a finger, one day you could be living in a, a normal life, uh, a life in a world that you've known, um, the only thing that you've ever known, really. And it's been grounded in your foundation for generations and thousands of years. And then one day that just turns upside down. Um, and people who you thought were your friends and your family can instantly become your enemies. In fact, um, when my parents were trying to make the escape, um, my dad didn't want to leave, but my mom saw that it was getting too dangerous. Her father was put into prison because he was a general um, for the government before. In fact, my dad's father was also a general, also put into prison um, by the communist regime. But my mom eventually said, it's too dangerous to stay. I want to leave. Um, and my dad said, I don't, this is my country. And then my mother just said, fine, you can stay, but myself, my two-year-old son, which was my brother, and my unborn child are leaving. And so then my dad said, okay, fine, then I guess I have to come too. Um, the thing was, is my dad every day would have to go to the passport office waiting for visas. And every day the passport office would turn him around. And this went on for about six months. And one day he walked again to the passport office and someone in that office felt sorry for him and said, you're never going to get your passport back. You're not getting your visas. Someone is blocking you. You have to find out who. 
So my dad made calls all the way up to the ministry. And at the ministry, he found out it was his own cousin who was blocking him from getting his pass the passports for his family. Um, and eventually in situations like that, you have to find someone who's more powerful, who has more say and was able to get those passports and those visas so my parents can leave. And as I said, you know, our first stop was Germany, uh, a little like, I mean, a lot like today, actually. Uh, Germany kind of serves as a bridge. They're allowing refugees and asylum seekers to come in, but they don't have the ability to absorb all those numbers. So what they're doing is they're allowing them to come in, but they're also helping them move elsewhere. Um, so when my parents came in, they applied for a visa to stay and they were denied it the first time around. And my mom's family had already started trickling into America because at the time um, the U.S. was accepting political asylum for Afghan refugees because of the, the Cold War between America and the Soviet Union. So we eventually made it to America when I was one. I grew up as what a lot of people would call a dual citizen. The actual term is dual citizen. Um, but what I always saw it as was a dual foreigner, uh, mainly because I didn't exactly feel American enough, but I also didn't feel Afghan enough. Um, I had my, I had a life between cross cultures. In my house, I had the Afghan culture. Outside of my house, you know, I assimilated into my school culture. Um, in certain ways, I was also lucky because I grew up in Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., um, where there were other people who were going through that same, you know, uh, cultural crisis, I guess you could say, or, um, you know, a, a clash of identities. I remember in second grade, my best friend was a Cambodian refugee. Um, although our cultures were completely different inside the home, what we did have in common was the fact that we were so different. Um, so growing up in Northern Virginia had its pluses and minuses. In fact, my high school was about 2000 students and it was one of the most diverse high schools in America and saying so in that there were 74 different languages spoken in that school and uh, people from 129 different countries, like different backgrounds. Um, in fact, when I was there in the 90s, yes, I'm that old, um, Hillary Clinton was the first lady back then and she had her race relations committee meet at my school at Annandale High School. And uh, it was interrupted by white supremacists that came as well. So it goes to show you that despite it being a diverse area, it also had, um, it also had its uh, white supremacists and um, I guess what we would call neo-Nazis today uh, that, would, that came and disturbed uh, that meeting. 10 years later, um, then First Lady um, Michelle Obama actually then decided to go to Annandale High School and brought the First Lady of South Korea with her because it also had a large Korean uh, American community. But despite that diversity there, we all still felt very different. Um, in fact, speaking of uh, the clashes and cultures, even the Afghan Americans in my school had a nickname for me. They called me Dukhtara Safed, which meant white girl, um, mainly because I played sports. I played tennis and I played softball. Um, I joined the debate team. I was doing extracurricular activities, which you know a lot of the Afghan Americans weren't doing. They would go home and they'd hang out with their cousins or hang out with their Afghan friends. And uh, they thought it was weird that I would stay in school after the school ended. So even and Americans, I didn't feel that I belonged. Um, and then eventually I thought, okay, well, you know, one day, my mom used to always say, one day you'll go back to Afghanistan, but the wars never ended. So we never did go back, at least to live. Um, but when I did go back for work, I thought, okay, when I step on the soil there, I'm going to feel like I belong because that's where my roots had been for thousands of years. But that wasn't the case. Um, in fact, when I got there, there were Afghans who accepted me, and then there were others who saw me as a foreigner, a traitor, um, 
because my family left, despite me being only a baby when my family left, they saw us as traitors for leaving Afghanistan um, and abandoning the country. Um, in fact, I did an interview once with one of their biggest television hosts for a show called Afghan Star, which was basically the American idol of Afghanistan. And there was an interpreter there who, when they when I arrived, they assumed that I didn't speak the language, but I did. But the interpreter stayed around because he was a really nice person and he just wanted to see what was going on. Um, the host of Afghan Star started saying, I'm a real Afghan. You're not a real Afghan. You abandoned us. You, you're not real. You're just this, this, and that. Um, and then when he left, the poor interpreter just said, don't listen to him. You are one of us. So there will always be people in both countries that have accepted me, and there will always be people who won't accept me in both countries. So this is what I call being a dual foreigner. But what I did have as an opportunity, and what I'm so grateful for with my parents choosing to come to America, um, even leaving Germany for that matter, because I don't know the opportunities, opportunities I would have had in Europe, um, compared to the opportunities I had in America. Um, the thing is, is you can work hard in America. You can really, really work hard and do your best. And hopefully you can make your dreams come true. There will be a lot of roadblocks and a lot of pe people of different cultures and backgrounds may have different challenges. Um, my challenges were different from a white American's challenges in my high school. But my challenges were also different from a black American's challenges in my school. Um, so it depends, obviously, on your circumstances. But if you work hard enough, you can try to pave your way. And I say this in the sense of I was very lucky that my parents focused on my education because I was able to follow my dreams. They wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer, as most immigrant parents do. Um, but I decided that I wanted to be a journalist. And I want to show you a little bit about what my job entailed as a journalist. Thousands of outraged Afghans are protesting the U.S. and the burning of the Korans for a fourth straight day. Our NBC News correspondent Atiyah Bowie was in the Capitol when gunfire broke out during one of her reports. <laughs> protesters have gotten out of hand. The Afghan army is trying to stop them. They're firing off warning shots. But we nearly got stuck in the protest and we have to run. We actually just found an IED, an improvised explosive device, down at the intersection there. And what they're about to do is detonate it. Thousands of... So... That's just a little clip about um, my work in Afghanistan. Um, the best part about being a journalist, at least um, in my line of work, was traveling around the world. Um, again, growing up as an other, you want to see what the others live like elsewhere as well. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough that my job eventually even got me back to Afghanistan. I went to Iraq, I went to Pakistan, I went to Africa. Um, I lived in the Middle East, um, but my first big job as a correspondent living abroad was in Afghanistan. Um, it takes a toll on you. The seeing the day in and day out of suffering does take a toll on you. And at the same time, when that man told me that, you know, I wasn't one of them, he had every right to say that. He had every right to say that because a lot of those Afghans had really difficult lives. Um, as difficult as my parents' lives were starting new in a new country and a new language and a new everything, um, they faced that difficulty and they faced it in a way so my brother and I didn't have to. They wanted us to focus on our education of our home, a home that they paid for for us, a home that they kept us safe in, a home that they kept us warm and fed in. Um, unfortunately, a lot of Afghans didn't do not have that still in Afghanistan. And seeing it daily weighed on my shoulders, um, as it honestly should for anyone who has a heart. Um, I think it weighed on the shoulders of a lot of my friends who aren't of Afghan background. Um, it becomes more than just work. Uh, these are some 
images of people that just stick, stick in my mind, stick in my heart. Um, every once in a while, you know, you'll think of them and, and cry as a journalist. Um, and they are people that you think about daily. It's not just something that you forget about. It's not something that, okay, well, maybe I'll think about, it'll pop in when I see something that reminds me of them. No, you think about them daily. You think about what's going on in their lives and their families' lives, because some of them didn't survive. Um, the top picture is of a young girl named Bibi Aisha. She was forced to marry a Taliban fighter who wasn't even there when they were forced to get married. Um, in fact, they married her off. She lived with his family and she was treated as a slave in the household. Um, she tried to run away and the neighbors, these two female neighbors said that they'd help her. Um, instead of helping her, they tried to sell her off to someone else. Um, so she then ran away from them as well. And when she ran away from them, they were, she was caught by her husband's family. And the first time she actually ever met her husband was when he came and they went to a Taliban trial. Um, and her punishment was to have her nose and her ears cut off. And then she was left to die on top of a mountain, a small mountain. She said that as soon as they started cutting, she passed out. And then when she woke up, she said, it felt like there was cold water in my nose. I opened my eyes and I couldn't even see because of all of the blood. She was eventually then taken to a hospital. But then because of the laws in Afghanistan, she was actually put in prison. Um, the president of Afghanistan at the time then commuted her sentence and she was released. And then she was taken in by the shelter, a woman's shelter, and it was the only woman shelter in Afghanistan um, at the time. Luckily, there's been more, but not nearly enough uh, as there should be. Uh, the little girl on the bottom in the red dress, she was four years old. She was four years old when a police commander's son, who was 19 at the time, kidnapped her, brutally attacked her and raped her, left her in a pond to die, and it was her father who found her. And a lot of times in Afghanistan, when that happens to a girl and she's found and she's alive, they let her die or they kill her because it's shameful that what, what was done to her is a shame on her, which is not right, but that's the way the culture, um, especially in the villages, often see it. But this father loved his daughter and he knew that he couldn't keep her in the village. So he took her to a hospital and then the hospital told him that, you know, this, you can't protect her up here in this village. So he took her to the capital of Kabul. He found the woman's shelter himself. The shelter said, we'll take care of her. We'll provide her the medical needs that she needs and we will raise her. And he said, please do, please do. I can't take her back to my village because they will kill her. Um, and the woman's shelter went out of their way, not just to help, which is what they should do. This is what any human being should do. But they also paid for the legal fees and they went to the government of Kabul to make sure they would get this commander's son. Um, and they did, but they only got him for six years in prison. And they knew it was too dangerous to send her back. So she is currently still living with them as they're educating her. Um, and hopefully one day she's going to be one of the female leaders in Afghanistan to help other young girls who unfortunately will be in the same situation or similar situations. Um, on the left is a teenage boy in a detention center. He was caught about to perform a suicide attack. Um, luckily he was caught before it happened, but his story really also stuck with me at how young this boy was, how he was so easily manipulated to turn away from his family and easily manipulated to kill other people in the name of God, but in the name of the God that he was being told uh, he should worship. Um, and these are, this is a story that I go into in one of my books um, in a fictional way. But it's not just Afghans. Again, Afghanistan is the longest war. 
um, that America has been a part of, uh, even longer than Vietnam. And over there on the, I guess, right-hand side of uh, my computer, I'm hoping it's the right-hand side of your computer as well, that's Sergeant Anthony D'Alessio. I was embedded with the Marines on what was called the most dangerous mission in NATO at the time. We were told we were going to jump off of helicopters together and air assault, and we were going to land in the biggest minefield in NATO's history. Um, and let's just say that 200 Marines were not excited for a female reporter with her female cameraman to be coming with them. It was one of the scariest nights of my life. It was one of the scariest nights of their lives. I remember shake, seeing shaking knees on these, you know, tough Marines. Um, and again, they were not excited to have a female journalist, a journalist, let alone a journalist, but a female journalist. The first person who reached out to me once we were in our so-called base that they made um, at a house, a mud hut house, uh, the first person that reached out to me was Anthony. Um, I saw the MREs. We were told to go get their MREs are meal ready to eat packs. Um, and I was told to go get one. And when I went there, a bunch of Marines were staring at me and I pulled one out and I pulled something out to eat. And I just heard a voice saying, it's full of carbs and calories. It's going to make you fat, ma'am. And I was just like, oh, God. Great. The first thing a Marine says to me when he talks to me is about my weight. Um, but it was just him breaking the ice and we started chatting. He started asking me about my family. I started asking him about his family. Um, he told me that he was the oldest sibling of, I believe, four, four or five siblings. His mother left him, left them when they were young and he basically became a parent um, to his siblings. And because Anthony spoke to me, I noticed the eyes of the other Marines being like, oh, well, what's going on there? And suddenly more and more Marines were coming up and talking and joining the conversation. And for two and a half weeks, I was with them. And for two and a half weeks, I felt like I had a bunch of little brothers who were taking care of me as well. You know, we were in a tough situation together um, as they were fighting the Taliban and as I was documenting it all. It was about two months after I left them to get go back to Kabul. Um, I got a message from another Marine saying that Anthony had volunteered to go on a patrol um, on his day off because he was bored. Um, so he went on a patrol and it was just one of those patrols where you wave and you say hi and you try to win hearts and minds. But as he was waving and saying hi, there was a sniper who shot him in the head and he died. He was only 19 years old. And of course, I kept thinking about his siblings and what they were going to do now. So I tell you these stories because, again, it becomes more than just work. And as a journalist, when I experience these stories, when I talk to these individuals, when I share their stories, as a television journalist, I'm only given at the most two minutes. There were times on NBC, on nightly news, where I only had 40 seconds to share what was going on. Um, if I write a piece for .com, I had at the max 750 words because I'm told that that's just the attention span for the readers. That's not enough time and not enough words to share what's actually going on, the background of what's going on. So, when I had the opportunity to write a novel, this was my chance. In fact, I had kind of an unconventional route of becoming a published author. Um, Penguin Books was looking for someone who knew Afghanistan, who could write a novel based in Afghanistan. As a journalist, you shouldn't use your imagination. Unfortunately, that's not what we're seeing a lot these last few years. We're seeing a lot of journalists um, publishing sh shady stories with not a lot of facts. But if you're a good journalist, you have to lose your imagination. When you're in a war zone, there's no imagination left. A dream of mine growing up had always been to write a novel, but I remember thinking at one point, this will never happen. I could put that dream and say that I can't do it anymore. But then this opportunity with Penguin popped up. And I said, you know what? 
let me give it a try, but how am I going to do this? So what I did was I decided to write realistic fiction. So what is that? Realistic fiction means that I am writing the truth. My novels are real stories, stories of many people combined into one. And it's the true colors. It's the true colors of the mountains of Afghanistan. It's the true feel of the sea of the Aegean Sea when the refugees were going from Turkey to Greece. Um, everything in my novels are real. Um, I approach it as a journalist. I, I do my research. I do my interviews. Um, I make sure I get out there and speak to the people. And it's a way of giving the readers the stories that I can't tell you as a journalist because I can't go in depth as much as I'd want to. And what my real goal with that is, is empathy and understanding. Um, I'm a true believer that empathy can change the world that we live in. Um, it's really easy, it's really easy to be afraid of what we don't know. Um, it's just human nature. It's human nature to be afraid of what you don't know. Um, but sometimes and oftentimes that fear of the unknown becomes hate. And it's something that we're seeing in America. It's something that we're seeing all over the world. And that's terrifying. But when someone empathizes and when someone understands and tries to understand what's going on, that instead of turning into hate, the fear of the unknown, it becomes an empathy for the unknown. It becomes understanding. It becomes reaching out and trying to figure out what's going on. So you get to know them more, doing your research, reading a book, talking to someone, um, just knowing that the other person that you're afraid of is also human. That empathy can turn into love. And again, that in itself can change the world drastically. So The Secret Sky, when I go into The Secret Sky, which is my first novel, I based it on the village that I went to. I based it on a village that I spent two weeks shooting a documentary on, a village of two different ethnicities. I based it on that boy in the detention center um, who was persuaded to be a suicide bomber. I went into how easily this some people can interpret a religion in a mentalist way and another can interpret it into love and acceptance. Um, and it's not just in Islam. We're seeing that in uh, Judaism and Christianity and Hinduism. It's in every religion. You have people who interpret their religion as love, and you have other people's, people who interpret their religion into hating others. Um, and I really dive into it in this novel because I think it's very important for people to understand why Afghanistan is America's longest war, why we're seeing fundamentalism not just there, but here. And I don't mean Islamic fundamentalism here. We're seeing a lot of people using um, Christianity as fundamentalism here. Uh, a lot of the white supremacist attacks that we're seeing, you know, it's people trying to interpret Christianity and taking it away from love and to turning it into hate. Um, when I wrote The Secret Sky, yes, I was focusing on Islamic fundamentalism. I was focusing on Afghanistan, uh, but more, more than Islamic fundamentalism, it really is about how easy it is to manipul manipulate youth into becoming extremists. Uh, different ways, obviously different countries, uh, although in Afghanistan they are using the web more and more, especially in the cities. Um, but in the villages, it was done through religious schools, what they pretended were religious schools. Um, in fact, when I interviewed four young boys, ages eight, nine, and two 10-year-olds, um, they were brainwashed across the border in Pakistan um, at a madrasa, which is a re religious school. But it wasn't really a religious school. It was just a man who's saying that it was a religious school. He basically told the children's parents, I can feed your children, which they were starving. I can give them a warm place to sleep, which they didn't have. And the parents thought this was a great opportunity, giving their kids food, a warm place to stay, and an education. Um, 
they were poor. They couldn't provide that. So the kids went to this man, and this man was raping them, uh, was uh, brainwashing them, and then sent them across the border with a driver and told them to kill people. The driver was the one who said to these kids, you do realize you're going to die. And these children said, no, I'm wearing this talisman. He said, this talisman will save us and only kill bad people. And the driver said, he's lying. And then they started crying and of course, asking for their mothers. And then the drivers dropped them off at a police station. Um, it was at that police station where those poor kids were again attacked by police officers. Um, as U.S. soldiers were outside of the room, um, according to the story that they told us when we interviewed them at the detention center. So these lives are not easy, um, and they weigh on you. Um, I'm going to get more into the, I guess, the trauma and releasing that trauma in my books, because obviously it's there in my mind. Um, for A Land of Permanent Goodbyes, which is my book on the refugee crisis, I was supposed to initially at the time be writing a book about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because I was living in Jerusalem. And I was doing my research on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, interviewing Israelis and interviewing Palestinians. Um, it was 2015, but all I could focus on was my television set as I was watching refugees literally dying trying to survive. Um, I was watching mothers pushing strollers on the side of European highways. Um, and all I could think about was my mother and my father and how they saved my brother and I um, escaping war, just as these parents were doing. Uh, I was watching children drowning, families drowning, uh, you know, on these images on television. And I finally told my editor, I was just like, I can't. I have to tell this story. I have to tell the refugee story. And luckily my editor is lovely and very supportive said, okay, fine. If you can keep the same deadlines, go ahead and do it. So as soon as I got the okay, I went about it as I would any story. I purchased some flights to Turkey where I interviewed refugees and saw what was going on in Turkey. Um, I purchased a flight to Greece and I luckily spoke Farsi with the Afghan refugees and Iranian refugees were coming in, but I didn't speak Arabic. So I had my friend who was um, an Arab American journalist living in Lebanon fly into Greece with me to help me with the Arabic and interviewing the refugees there. You know, this was a few weeks, a few weeks of intense in-person um, in-person research, but this also involved a lot of social media research. Um, luckily, we live in a time where we can connect with people all over the world at the touch of a hand. You know, you pick up your phone and you can connect with someone on the other side of the planet. Um, I was able to find Syrians inside of Syria who I could talk to through WhatsApp. Um, I had uh, worked with Syrians to help me describe, you know, Raqqa, because I couldn't get into Raqqa. Raqqa was the de facto capital of ISIS at the time. But I could talk to Syrians living in it, uh, citizen journalists who could help me. In fact, I owe a lot to a Syrian doctor who was also a citizen journalist. He was working with um, a group of Syrians to help get the real story out since journalists couldn't get in. Um, and this poor guy was busy enough, but he, went through 30,000 words in my book over and over again to make sure that I got the details correct because I see it as my duty on two fronts. I feel very responsible to the subjects I'm writing about and I feel very responsible to the readers who are gonna read about it. I don't wanna give my readers a story that isn't true. There are different stories out there. It's not to say that my story is the only story of the Syrian refugee, but it is a story or several stories of Syrian refugees brought into a novel format. My next book that's coming out is a little different because it's not fiction, it's nonfiction. 
Um, it's part of a She Persisted series by Chelsea Clinton, where she wrote uh, children's books about females, strong females. Uh, and it's to teach young boys and young girls that there are very strong females in our history that, you know, we haven't really learned too much about. Um, and, you know, there are women of color in this series. Uh, my, my book was about Sally Ride, who was the first U.S. female astronaut in space. Um, so basically, Chelsea wrote this book about different strong females for young readers. And then they picked different to write a little bit of a longer format for uh, middle grade readers. So I approached this in a similar fashion. I did my research. I interviewed her life partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy. I called her up. We talked for a few hours, a um, couple hours. Uh, I read her official biography. I went through so many of her past interviews because Sally Ride herself passed away in 2012. Um, I fact checked uh, through her uh, Institute, Institute Sally Ride Science at University of California, San Diego. Again, this was this was probably easier to write because I I, I kept it completely true because it is a biography. Um, at least with the the Secret Sky and Atlanta Permanent Goodbyes, despite all of it being true, I still had to combine different stories. This was just one story, um, but I'm really excited about this book. This is going to be. Um, part of a series that, you know, is about strong females uh, in American history. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they'll also make a middle grade series for her second book, which was about strong females around the world. Uh, so again, approaching it like a researcher. So now let's move on. And I want to kind of bring you guys into this. And I would love to get some, some of your ideas. Um, why do we read? There are many reasons why we read. We read to escape. Um, books are more personal and intimate than television. We watch TV to escape as well. But when we read books, I mean more intimate and more personal because we're reading about the shiver in their skin, the touch of the cold cheek or the soft lips. Um, it's definitely more personal and intimate, and it's a way for us to just leave our world in a way that we can't with anything else. Reading is also for understanding. Um, how many times have you wondered what was going on in the world and decided, you know what, I should read about this? Um, whether it be a book, whether it be a magazine, whether it be a newspaper article, um, it's a way of understanding. It's a way of understanding the world in which we don't get from textbooks. Um, for instance, I was reading something about the Ottoman Empire and I realized, oh, you know, I am ne I was never taught about the Ottoman Empire growing up, um, except for things that my parents might have mentioned. But I know for sure my husband, who grew up in a white American household, probably barely heard about the Ottoman Empire. Um, so I decided to download a book on my Kindle so I can learn more about it. And I realized, too, people in Turkey, this is what they're learning you know, and we're becoming a more globalized world. We should know each other's history so we can understand what's going on in today's conflicts as we're seeing even in Turkey right now or Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, and we read textbooks, really. Um, we're forced to read in um, schools depending on what books our teachers pick, but we're also reading textbooks. Um, we read because we're told to. We read because it's fun, again, to learn, to entertain. Um, I'd love to know if you guys have other reasons why you read. Atia, this is Tasha. I want to share with you some of the really profound statements <laughs> that are being made in response to what you have said. Um, Jeanette said, all too often we think our stories aren't important because they aren't the story that is already out there, but your perspective matters. Your story is important because it's yours. Um, and Jerrica Jordan said, and this could work for both young girls and young boys, it's important to read these. And um, I think that just sharing stories has such a powerful um, way to unite what we think may be different from ourselves. And I think that's what many of these comments are um, hearkening back to. That's, 
That's great. Tracy Soto says, I read to meet new people because I'm too introverted to meet new people in real life. <laughs> that's a great reason. Right. That's beautiful. That's, that's so true too. That's, that's a, that's a great reason that I didn't even think of. And it's, it's a fantastic reason. Um, I, I think another reason I'm personally anxiety, I can't yeah. sleep because I'm so anxious and I'm thinking too much. If I read, it'll help me calm down and hopefully help put me to sleep. Right. Right. Yeah. Or find the answers you're looking for. Sometimes I'll turn to a book and think, well, maybe if I just read this passage from this book, it'll click on something. Absolutely. Me. Absolutely. And that's a great reason. That's a great reason. Another reason, I guess I read to my kids, you know, I started reading to them at a month old. Um, it's a bedtime routine. Yeah. And now my five-year-old's into Harry Potter, at least the third one. I don't know if I should, a second one. I don't know if I should move past that though. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a way of escaping and it's a way of feeling something that's different. Great. Right. Yeah. And then, so the last comment I'll share with you is, um, let's see, let me find it once more. It was from Disha Colin. I read to connect to the stories of others. Yeah. It's perfect. Exactly. And I, I, and I, I think that a lot of authors, including myself, feel great hearing that um, because I think that's a lot of the goals of people writing. Um, and also Tasha, feel free to interrupt whenever I'm talking, because I'd love to engage more and hopefully we're going to be now moving part to part of the slides where I want to engage more um, with everyone who's listening in. Okay. Um, Oh, there is, I would love to read this. So Jose says, I grew up undocumented and came across Lives in Limbo by Roberto G. Gonzalez. It was refreshing to hear that other people were going through the same thing I was going through. Connection. Yes. That's beautiful. And, it, and it's, it's, it's a situation where you're scared and then suddenly you realize you're not alone. Exactly. Which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing that, Jose. Um, and that's going to go into this um, diversity in books, diverse books. Um, it's a fairly new phenomenon. Um, you know, we have now a plethora of books to choose from um, and a plethora of topics to choose from that is opening our eyes to our neighbors and our world or connecting us, as Jose said, to people who are similar to us, even though we felt we were alone at times or different, um, or even if you knew there was someone else out there who was going through something, you just didn't know who they were or what they were going through, because everyone's different. Everyone has a different experience. Um, people of color often in the past were used only as supporting roles, and sometimes we're still seeing that in books, um, but really were used as supporting roles in the white narrative and often were portrayed as a stereotype of their color, their race, their religion, their culture. Um, and this is this was a problem and still is a problem oftentimes, but because we have such a diversity in books now, we get to see we get to see more a more of a three-dimensional figure of our neighbors the people that we see down the street, the people that we hear about. Um, I know that there are still some communities where there aren't people, that many people of color. Um, so it's a way of, as one of the comments also stated, is meeting new people. Um, and now we're seeing people of color as main characters. Um, when I wrote my books, I didn't, my goal and aim wasn't, I'm gonna introduce you to a person of color. My goal and aim was to, I'm gonna tr introduce you to a different place in the world. Um, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that this was a. Hey, I'm going to introduce you to a person of color who's different, who has a Muslim religion, who's this and that and that. My goal was in understanding and connecting, um, but. But, I'm so glad that it is introducing people to, to people of a different religion that they might not have known. I had one librarian who shared her the secret sky with her middle school students. And um, one of the, one of, one caveat she had is if you took a book, 
you read it, you had to write her an email about what you thought about the book. And one boy responded and said, you know, I was a bigot towards Islam. I mean, that's huge for a 12 year old to say, even to right. bigot, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The awareness that he had to have. Exactly, exactly. And for me, that was just, wow. You know, even if my book doesn't reach a lot of people, it reached that one kid. And that changed his perspective at 12. Because God knows what he was being taught at, like, you know, within his friends, at home, who knows? Because we all have our prejudices and we see it a lot more in the generations before. And unfortunately, there's a lot of those generations who are trying to trickle it down to the younger generations um, and trying to hold on to a lot of these prejudices, despite us being in a world where young people have the opportunity to reach out and try to understand more than our parents did, than our grandparents did. Um, so for that kid to say that, it, it made the painstaking and agony of writing my first book completely <laughs> worth it. Right. Um, yeah. Well, and there's some a comment that I think really um, aligns with what you're talking about. So Marie says, I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian household, and many of the stories I have read of Muslim girls growing up in fundamentalist Muslim households were so similar. Being able to relate that much to characters and see it's like universal healing. That's amazing. And that's, that's so good to hear. And it also makes me think that I want to know more about her story. Like I, right. I want to know more about her writing about what's going on in her life. And it goes to saying that diversity isn't about putting down one group to just raise another. Diversity mm -hmm. is to find that connection with each other um, to, to go back to the topic of just, you know, finding the human in each other because we're all human. Unfortunately, we dehumanize each other um, more often than we should. Um, yeah. Diversity is also realizing there are other people in the world that aren't like you. Um, that's another amazing thing about diverse books. Um, and really the, the definition of diversity is is that it's just it's not just about the white straight narrative um it there's more to books but again i go into the fact too that there is diversity among white authors as well like there are stories like when we were talking about growing up in a fundamentalist christian household we're not we're not told that story either you know that's not the straight narrative that we're used to um, and we have diverse authors for that. So diversity of color, diversity of background, diversity of cultures, diversity of disabilities. I mean, how often did we grow up reading about a character with disabilities, uh, sexual orientation, diversity, again, you know, it's fairly new to read about a gay or lesbian character or transgender character in a book or see them on television and any kind of medium for that matter. Um, one of the coolest things about reading books to my son is he doesn't he doesn't have what I had as a kid, which was you could only this was the only narrative. He's getting all these other narratives. Um, I'll, moving a little bit from books to television, there's a show on um, on Netflix called Raising Dion, and it was really cool to share. Despite my kid. My kid doesn't look, my son doesn't look like me. My daughter looks like me. My son looks like my husband, blonde hair, blue eyes. But it was really cool to be able to show them a young black boy who's a superhero. And his best friend is a young girl with a disability in a wheelchair. And to be able to show them him that at the age of five, so he knows that this is normal. This is what America is. This is what the world is. He'll never grow up thinking that it's different. Oh, yes, I love that. Sandra White says, my grandson loves Raising Dion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great show. My son keeps asking about season two and when it's going to start. I keep trying to tell him coronavirus has slowed some things down. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's a great show. And it's, I'm glad that your grandson watches it because, again, he's going to grow up thinking like, OK, you know, anyone has this, the power to do anything. I mean, obviously, we don't have superpowers, but I mean, it's not just a young white boy who's going to be able to do that. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with a young white boy being able to dream about being a superhero either, but it's just the ability to give other children that same dream 
that when we were young was only given to one one narrative. Right. Um, right. And and you had mentioned something previously about fear and the unknown. We fear the unknown. So I think this is exactly what you're talking about. Storytelling is a way to illuminate that unknown and make it known so that you no longer fear it. Exactly. Exactly. And you can embrace it with love. I was, um, someone was telling me, I was, there's this workout and there was a female instructor and um, she was of Nigerian black background. She was, she was an American, but her parents were from Nigeria. She grew up in Texas. Um, and she was telling a story about when she was younger, how, you know, her friends, she overheard her friends talking about her dark skin and, and telling is saying to each other how unattractive it was. And she went home crying to her brother because she was a young girl. She was just a little girl and her brother was a little boy. And she went to her brother and just said, how can I make my skin lighter? Um, and then she proceeded to tell the story about how her brother and her decided, you know, make a bathtub of bleach and water. Um, and when I was listening to the story the other day, it was making me so sick to my stomach that like how just overhearing those little bits from someone and because that's all you see on TV, that's all you read about in books. She thought it was okay to put bleach in a bathtub. Um, she said, luckily she only stuck her hand in and that was enough for her to feel the pain and decided not to do that. Um, little kids should not think that way. Little oh, kids no. should not be afraid that way. Right. And that's the beauty in diversity. Diversity and differences shouldn't be threatening. It just should be inclusive. It's just to say that, you know, we are here, they are here, we are together, you know, we're in this together. Um, so again, as we mentioned, you know, empathy, 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 empathy. If we empathize, it'll turn into love. If we don't empathize, it can turn into hate. And that just makes our wor world a really scary and terrifying um, place. Right. And empathy is so different from sympathy as well. Exactly. exactly. So glad that you said that because one of one of the things that really bothers me is when some when people say, I sympathize, but there's no buts about it. Right. No one wants a sympathy. People want they want the empathy, especially if you proceed if if you follow that sympathy with, but <laughs> I'm not racist. But like <laughs> right, which ne completely negates what you just said. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Right. Going in a little bit of statistics here. So this has been done by the Cooperative uh, Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, this is for the year 2019. Um, about a fourth of books uh, were about people of color, children's books, I should say. Um, and less than one fourth of those authors were of people of color, written by people of color. Um, uh, so that's something. That's actually something. Um, and I would probably argue that we're seeing more diversity in children's books than we are in books written for adults. Um, we still have a long way to go for books written by adults. And the YA children's genre um, is where we're seeing the most diversity. Um, this was for the world statistics. For the U.S. statistics, uh, a little less than a third was written by Black, Indigenous, or people of color about them. And a little less than a fourth of that was written by a person of color. So we're still seeing um, we're seeing both people of color and white authors, you know, bringing in more of a diverse characters um, into their books. I say this, and now we're going to compare it to the 1985 through 1993 statistics, which were so bad that they didn't have people of color. They just said black authors and illustrators not even if it was about um, black characters, it was just black authors and black illustrators and or, so not just both. 1980, 1993, only 1% was written by a black author and or illustrator. In 1985, it was less than 1%. So does that mean we've come a long way? 
or is it sad that we've only gotten this far? Curious to know what you guys think about that. Are there any comments coming up? Uh, while we're letting that percolate, um, it looks like Monique says, I work in an assisted living with the elder um, of that time of racism. And a lot of them will tell you how they never liked anyone of color, but as they got older and their family changed, uh, they changed their way of thinking and, and had a love for people of color. That's interesting. I'm actually, can I ask a question? Is, is, did you say Monique? Mm -hmm. Can Monique, I'm curious to know, um, did they say that they changed their perspective because of meeting people of color or because their family changed their perspective on it? So she has written that their family changed their perspective, but I would love that clarification as well. Because I'm curious to know because sometimes a lot of, I guess, older people never really came across people of color as often as at least in situations that like we do today. Right. Um, okay, she answered yes, because of their family. Interesting. Hmm. And that's good to know. We can change our family's minds if we don't agree with them. That's right. Not, I always thought that was a little more difficult to do, especially in the world that we're seeing today, politically divided. Um, that's awesome. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Any ideas? What about you, Tasha? Do you think we've come a long way or do you think we it's sad that we've gotten only this far? So I would love to be an optimist and most of the time I am, but I really do feel like we should have gotten further by now. But I will celebrate any progress. Uh, but yes, I, I wish it was a little bit more. And I'm with you on that. I want to celebrate the progress as well. And it would be nice if it was more. Um, but the fact that we have options out there is is great. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, going back into like diversity is we get to choose what we buy. You know, we get to choose the books that we want to read. We get to choose the books we want to read to our children. So we have that power in our fingertips as well. So the change isn't just coming from the publishing houses. The change has to come from the consumers too. Right. Um, right. So, you know, we, we have a responsibility ourselves to support uh, books about people of color and disabilities, different backgrounds, different, um, different. And we have, we can also support diverse authors, you know, um, That's right. And it doesn't mean we don't have to uh, support white authors either. Like we, we can, we can do it all. It's, it's a matter of just doing. Um, but then this goes into cultural appropriation. Mm. Um, and I'm going to put this question out there before I start talking. Should we see more white authors start writing about people of color, um, it's a touchy subject. So I'm curious to know what other people think because we've seen a lot of campaigns against authors and books written by either white authors or even authors of a different race from those of their character. So they could actually be an author and who's a person of color, but they've written about someone else's I guess, ethnicity or culture or background. Um, and I say this too, as someone who was terrified writing my books. Um, I was terrified writing about a book in Afghanistan, despite being of Afghan background, despite living in modern Afghanistan for, the last, for four and a half years, I was terrified of what some responses would be. Um, and then moving on to the Syria story, I was also terrified of what Syrians might think. Uh, this is why I worked alongside Syrians, you know, of course, there's going to be um, people who are going to be upset. But what bothers me more is not when someone writes a story from another person's perspective. What bothers me personally is when they do it without putting the effort to really understand and going back to empathize with the subject. Um, my biggest issue is when an author decides to just use that person of color as a prop 
uh, I want to try to sell books. I better put a little bit of diversity in it and then just drop someone in there. And it's not done with sensitivity and understanding the way that it should be done. Um, oftentimes, when we have a person of color character or a person who has maybe like a disability or is um, LGBT, LGBTQ, it's, it becomes about that person's color, about that person's uh, disability more than it becomes about the person, if that makes sense. Um, this is the same in any medium, whether it be books, television, or movies, uh, unfortunately. Um, I we do have some some responses to this. Okay. Um, this this sparked quite a conversation. So Tracy Soto says, "I say no. Instead, we should encourage uh, people of color to write with their own voices." Marie Conley, no, they need to amplify the voices of people of color, not speak over them. We have plenty of people of color authors. Sandra White, until you walk in a black person's life, you probably want to get the real story. So I think that's what you're talking about is you can't just use what you know <laughs> and use you know the, the voice as a prop, um, actually do the research and be represent, representative. So hmm, let's see what else. Jeanette White authors, if they decide to use a BIPOC character, must consult with a BIPOC so they don't fall into racist stereotypes they might be unaware of. Yes. Um, there's lots of votes for amplifying their voices. <laughs> Let's see. Here's a long one. I'm a daughter of immigrants. This is Adelaide, Adelaide, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. I'm a daughter of immigrants moving from Mexico to the United States. I had no idea about the racism we grew up in. Um, property, pro poverty maybe. I started learning about racism when I went to middle school. It came back to me because of my accent as I spoke English since Spanish was my first language. The different uh, social classes were more, more noticeable to me when I got older and around people born here with more money. As of right now, I'm a mother of three and I show my kids to love everyone without looking at color, ethnicity, um, or religion. And that's beautiful. That's, I mean, it's beautiful that she's teaching her children that way. And I'm sorry that she dealt with that uh, growing up. Unfortunately, I, I get it. I mean, I get it. My parents had an accent. Um, I did not, but I, I noticed it. Um, I noticed the way they were treated as opposed to the way I was treated. And I've tried to explain to my husband, um, and he's learned it as well. Like when we first started dating, I remember he'd be like, oh, you're being paranoid. Stop. Not everyone's racist. And then as time on and, you know, he'd go to the store with me and we'd be in separate parts of the store. He would notice someone following me around and not him around. Um, he would notice like when he would go out with my parents without me, how they would be treated and how they would ignore them and talk to him. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's something that I, I'll, I think I might be touching on later, but it's, it, it is, it is different for a person of color to be able to understand things that a white person may not. Right. Um, but it also makes a huge different when, difference when that person wants to understand, starts to understand, asks questions, um, takes the effort to try to understand. Um, I agree, there are a lot of people who have their own voice that can share their own stories and they could be great writers too. But my suggestion to white who want to write um, a character that's going to be a person of color um, is, you know what? If you really, really want to write about it, do it, do it right. Um, and guess what? Some people might not want to read it. That's fine. Some people might want to read it. You know, it's, it's going to be all relative. You don't control who's going to buy your books. Um, if, Someone doesn't want to read a story by an author who's writing about a, a white author who's writing about a black character. They're not going to spend their money and they're not going to pay for it. Um, and they're not going to want to read it. But if that's really what you want to write, do it. See if it's good. If it's not, you know, 
how about you, you can go ahead and try to help another author who is a person of color and see how that goes. I mean, I don't think it should stop you from writing it. Um, I should also say that, you know what, everyone gets canceled at one point <laughs> in the world that we live in today. Uh, how many times have we seen JK Rowling being canceled this year alone? Um, right. And people get canceled. Some people come back for another day. Um, but again, if you're going to do it, just try to do it right. And also just expect some pushback from some people and some people might embrace it. Who knows? You might do a great job. You might be an incredible author that could do more justice to the story uh, than than other people than people may think. You know, what was it? The book American Dirt, who that got a lot of controversy, but it also got a lot of readers and it got a lot of people who um, who wanted to read about it, who wanted to understand it. So again, that was. One we actually have a comment about that in the in the chat. So yeah. uh, Tracy Soda says it reminds me of the controversy last year over the Oprah book pick American Dirt. It was a story of a Mexican immigrant told by someone who didn't have firsthand experience of what it means to be um, to live as an immigrant immigrant. The story wasn't hers to tell. Um, and then there's something else I, I think it's interesting. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. So this is from Cody Pavelka, I think. I volunteered in Uganda and a woman named me a dress when I was there. I love the dress and I'm so proud of it. I wore it to a wedding and I was told that I should not wear it because it was cultural appropriation because of the print. And then um, another comment from that same person, a big part of cultural appropriation versus appreciation is about intent versus impact. You may have intended to honor the Ugandan culture, but people can still be hurt by it, by our actions, and we have to respect that. That's a very interesting commentary. What do you think about that? So this one's been really hard for me because um, I agree with both um, in the sense of, I remember growing up, you know, we'd get really excited if we saw someone wearing an Afghan like outfit. We, we saw it as a sign of respect to our culture. Um, and now, in today's world, um, I'm seeing a lot of young Afghans who get offended when someone is wearing an Afghan dress um, amongst Afghan Americans. I'm basing it on this. Um, I think that there will always be two ways of understanding it. Um, I think that we have to respect we have to respect people's um, pains and sensitivities, to be honest. Um, but at the same time, there will also be people like me who will still feel a sense of pride when someone, you know, picks up an Afghan dress and says, this is so beautiful, you know, I want to wear it. And I think that's just because I grew up thinking that way. Um, but I also understand the Afghans who don't feel that way. Um, again, it goes back to, it goes back to not, not every person is going to see the world in the same fashion. Um, I do think that when we do approach our own, um, I guess, I guess when I see some Afghans who do get upset about it, they go on the attack really fast. I think approaching it in a sensitive fashion and saying like, hey, I don't like this because of this, you know, and, and starting a dialogue is better than attacking right away. And I know there are going to be people be people who completely disagree with me. And I completely understand that as well. Um, as I'm sure that, again, going back to writing about touchy, like, subjects of, of the culture of appropriation, writing books is, you know, Alana Permanent, I'm not Syrian, you know, I may have been a refugee, I was born a refugee. Um, I'm not Syrian, though. But I went out of my way to make sure I wrote this alongside Syrians. Um, mm -hmm. I spoke to them, uh, that Syrian doctor who, who God bless him, you know, had his own life to deal with. In fact, in the middle of my writing the book, he moved, he found his way from Syria to, I wanna say it was Serbia, and was trying to get his doctorate in Europe because he was a doctor in Syria, but his degree didn't transfer. And as he's studying, he's reading 30,000 pages of my book to make sure I got it correct because it was just as important to him. And I'm so grateful to him, but it was just as important to him to make sure that people got the real Syrian story. Um, and, and that was beautiful to me. 
Um, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful that they allowed me, he allowed me to do that, that it has been embraced by Syrian refugees who have read it. Um, I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that just underscores what you've been talking about uh, throughout is that empathy. So you said, I know that people will disagree and everyone has a different perspective. And then you gave your opinion and then he said, but I'm okay with people disagreeing with that. And I understand why they would disagree. And there it is. There's the empathy that you're talking about um, that probably makes you the, the wonderful journalist that you are. <laughs> Sweet of you to say, I don't know about that, but thank you. <laughs> But like, I look at something like the Washington Redskins, you know, so I grew up DC area. We were diehard football fans. Um, I completely agree with getting rid of that name, the Redskins. I know there are a few people who are out there who are like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's this and this and that, that I don't agree with. You know, if there is a group of people that are completely hurt and when you look at the background of the name, I remember having this argument with some diehard Redskins fans and I was just like, no, I refuse to buy my, I've bought my children Washington Capitals gear, Washington Nationals gear. I have Virginia Tech Hokies gear, but I've never ever bought them a Redskins anything. Um, and so there will be people who disagree with me on that as well, but usually that's completely different from what I'm, trying to get out when it comes to writing people of color. Again, taking it with sensitivity. So nothing is more frustrating when someone takes a sensitive topic, but doesn't handle it with sensitive practices. Mm. Um, I've literally sprouted more gray hairs and cut my life short from stress by writing these novels and wondering what people will think than I ever did by living in a war zone for half a decade. Um, to me, running from bullets and bombs was less stressful than writing these books, because in my mind, I kept just thinking about, am I giving my subjects the respect that they deserve? And am I giving the readers the respect that they deserve as well? Right. That is so powerful. Yes. The sensitivity and the research um, are critical when writing <laughs> and, you know, sharing stories in general. So I love that. <laughs> There's a lot of agreement. Um, in the in the chat oh my yes yes that's so bad when you're referring to the Washington Redskins <laughs> yes yes and uh, I'm still in shock that there are still people who defend it and outwardly defend it and even even and I I, I noticed that they're they feel more comfortable approaching say my husband because I guess he's white mm -hmm. um when they talk about it and then they're shocked like I had a friend who married a guy from DC and she's not from DC and he's a Redskins fan and he didn't say it to me like when when we were talking about the name changes was years ago because it didn't even happen until recently but um he wouldn't look at me he looked at my husband and except expected my husband to agree with him like it's ridiculous it's stupid they should just keep the name it's about this and that and I think he felt more comfortable because my husband was white and just assumed because he was white, he would agree with them. Mm -hmm. And he was blown away by, with me, I just rolled my eyes and I was just like, I'm not even going to get into this. I'm going to talk to my friend. But my husband then was just like, Whoosh, and he just was. Boom. <laughs> and I think that helps too, is when, when you don't just sit there and stay quiet and smile. Um, I think for me, it was just like, I'm just not dealing with this. I don't have the energy, but with my husband, it was more of, I have to deal with this because I am the white guy in the room and he thinks that I'm just going to agree with him. Right. It's kind of like his responsibility now that you yeah. were talking to. And so we've got a comment. So that explains my writer's block <laughs> from Jeanette <laughs> because of the, uh, the stress you said you underwent when you were writing these books versus actually being in a war zone. That's pretty incredible statement to make. And it really, I think it, a lot of the writers out there can empathize and um, see themselves in that stress <laughs> when you're writing something that's important to you. Absolutely. I mean, I was going to get on about criticism later. You will always find someone who hates 
your book. You will always find someone who's going to like love your book and your writing or whatever. Um, there will be both sides to everything. It was interesting with Atlanta Permanent Goodbyes. I thought I would have, I, I did not expect, there was a, a couple criticisms that I saw in Goodreads and it actually came from Muslims who weren't Syrian, who weren't Afghan, but they were angry that, um, that I made the main character's family not too religious. And I was a little shocked by that because I was thinking, well, not every family is ridiculously re religious or not every family is ridiculously unreligious. Um, I tried to find like something that I knew that I could write about. Um, and it was interesting to see someone get upset because I didn't have them very religious. So again, it's interesting where your criticisms will come from. And then I got praise from certain people who were anti-refugee until they read the book. So I thought my criticisms would come here and not from here. And it was the other way around. So my advice is just write, just write, just write, just write, and then share your writing with someone that you trust, share your writing with someone that you don't know that might know the topic better than you and just see what they have to say. Um, if you really want to write about it, write about it. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that someone's going to read it, but at least you wrote about what you wanted to write about, what was in your heart, what was in your mind. Um, but again, do it with sensitivity. Language and context is also very important. And I'm going to say this from a journalistic perspective, and then I'm going to bring it in um, to you guys, because I want you guys to think about this as well when it comes to everyday life here. So I lived in Jerusalem. Clearly, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is still going on there, has been going on there, um, and it's going to still be going on there. Is this a barrier, a wall, or a fence? And depending on where you come from and your political perspective, your nationalistic perspectives, is how you label it. Israel calls it a security barrier. They claim that since they put up this fence or barrier um, or wall, they claim it has substantially thwarted terror attacks on the Israeli populace. Um, and statistics actually do uh, do work in their favor on that. But it's not just the wall that could have brought in the security. Palestine calls it an apartheid wall. Um, it's disrupted lives of Palestinians. It's stolen land from families. It's separated families from families on the other side of the wall. And it's even separated businesses. Like, so someone could have lived on one side of the wall and then had their shop on the other side. Um, and it's not easy to go back and forth. Um, Israeli settlers who live within the walls can easily go back and forth. But if you're a Palestinian with a Palestinian ID, um, it's not easy for them to go back and forth. So language matters. Um, language really matters in how you write books. Again, it's approaching it with sensitivity. If I said wall, I would be saying, I would basically be saying it from one person's perspective. If I said barrier, I was saying it from another person's perspective. And as a journalist who I worked with CNN, um, I worked with NBC and I worked with Al Jazeera English when, all when I was in Jerusalem. Um, CNN I did before I moved there, but I was there for the flotilla attack. Um, and uh, I was told to call it Palestinian territories, not Palestine. Uh, when I was at NBC, uh, they gave me more leeway. I could call it West Bank, um, Palestinian territories. If I said Palestine, you could probably get away with it here and there. Um, when I was at Al Jazeera, I had to call it West Bank or occupied West Bank if it was a political story. Um, I put Fox News up there because uh, they also have their own ways of describing things. They do not call it Judea and Samaria, but that's something I learned when I lived in uh, Jerusalem is the nationalists will call it Judea and Samaria. They will not acknowledge that it's Palestinian land 
or even the West Bank. They'll call it the historical biblical name. So there are different ways that you say things and different ways that they will be perceived and you will be perceived as to what side of the story that you're on. Um, the language you choose affects how your readers will see your writing and even more important, their understanding of a topic. So again, this goes back to the responsibility of what you write, who you write about, um, how you want it to be perceived. So when I approach my topics, I want people to understand what's going on within the people. So this is why I combine the stories of people I meet to just give them the truest, truest story that I can give to the reader so they could understand it at the truest value. So if I would have continued my Israeli-Palestinian story, <coughs> excuse me, I would have continued to, to um, interview both Israelis and Palestinians on different sides of the issues. It's not just a two-sided story. It's a multifaceted side of the story as every story should be approached. Um, again, I'm only giving this as an example because it's an international story that I lived in as a journalist, but I would love to know if you guys have any examples of how words can change um, here in America, anywhere else in the world. Uh, I, can, I can say something in the sense of illegal versus undocumented very, that's a weighted, weighted word. And it shows a lot politically and mentally of where you stand about an immigrant. Um, anyone have any other examples? That's exactly the example um, from Jeanette, illegal versus undocumented. And then something else um, that's been coming up in the news or maybe brought to my attention more so is rape versus sex with underage women and how different that yes. lands. Um, yes. yes. Yes, that's so true. That's so true. And that's something that we're seeing a lot. And I find it very irresponsible. Mm -hmm. when I see it in news stories, like sex with a minor. Right. Right. That's rape. That's rape. <laughs> yeah. Or when they call it a, uh, what is, what is a, uh, the other way they describe rape sometimes they say uh like brutal rape as in there's no all rapes are brutal mm -hmm. um yes we've got another one so the term thug when that's yeah. used um that's pretty powerful and how thugs are portrayed we've got lone war lone wolf versus terrorist yes um, Yes. Militia versus gang. Mm -hmm. Abortion versus sexual reproductive rights for women. That's pretty weighted as well. Those are great examples. Stranger rape versus acquaintance rape. Um, not all rape is brutal. Yes. So these are some of the examples you were talking about. This is interesting. Jose says terrorism in the news cycle sometimes is only applied to Muslim um, related incidents. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't really call it domestic terrorism when it is domestic terrorism, if it is a uh, white attacker. Um, if it was a group of Muslims who are trying to attack and kill the governor of Michigan, I wonder how it would have played in the news cycle as opposed to how it didn't play in the news cycle when it was a group of white men. Right. Our current administration does not want to call it white fundamentalist terrorism. And then um, there's another comment calling white supremacists by other names than what they truly are. So I think those are really interesting. Yeah, what was the, what was the term that they kept calling um, alt-right? Mm -hmm. alt right instead of neo Nazis or white supremacists, or, right. um, you know, they're never called white thugs. Um, yeah, these are great examples. These are great examples. Um, and I'd like to 
know what your goals are when it comes to writing. And I'd like to say that I hope no answer will be money <laughs> because um, writing books doesn't really make money anymore unless you're J.K. Rowling. I'll be lucky if my books pay for a Costco trip here and there or a Target trip. Um, but you never know. You could become a bestseller. Um, I do also think that you should always be impeccable with your words. Uh, they're permanent when you write a book. And once you publish your book, it will represent you and your writing for a very long time. Um, your writing could also change perspectives, um, especially for people that you have never met and you may never meet, um, which is probably the best goal to have if, um, if that's really what you're looking to do. Um, anyone have their own goals when they come to write when they're writing? None yet. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for responses. That's fine. I'll, as as you wait, I will also talk about um, what you can do and how you can write about what you know. Um, how are you diverse? You know, I mean, we are all diverse. We are all, you know, none of us are a blank canvas. You know, we all have color in our lives and our backgrounds, you know. Not every white person is the same. Not every black person is the same. Not every Muslim is the same. Not every uh, Latino or Latinx is the same. Uh, not every Asian is the same, clearly, too. It just, you know, we all have different aspects of our lives that fill up our canvas. Um, my books come from an international perspective, um, but we have a vast kaleidoscope of diversity and dimensions within America. Um, and to pretend that America is one bland canvas, like so many desperately actually want us to believe, is a lie. Um, the borders of America contain not just culture diversity, but diversity within the cultures. Um, we are not a melting pot. We are that mixed salad, I guess, as people put it. Um, as much as we like to pretend that we could become a melting pot, we shouldn't. You know, that would just make these beautiful colors into one bland, boring color. Um, so look at your diversity, see what makes up your canvas and what part of that canvas do you wanna share with the world that you think that the world should learn more about? Um, you know, it's, and it doesn't even have to be your canvas that you're interested in. See someone else's canvas and talk to them about theirs. If they're, if they, if you wanna encourage them to write about it, but they can't, how about you work with them in telling and sharing their story if they can't do it themselves? Um, and I go back to, I go back to, let's look at the 2016 election. I look back at a lot of my friends, including my husband, who said that, you know, Trump cannot be elected. And my husband is a very political minded, political junkie. He knows statistics, he follows polls, he does all of that, and he kept telling me statistically it's impossible. Statistically, he cannot be elected, it's impossible, blah, blah, blah. Democrats have this, this, and this. Republicans don't have this, this, and this, and blah, blah, blah. Statistics, statistics, statistics. Um, and I kept telling him, no, he's going to be elected, Connor. And he was just like, no, statistically impossible, 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 impossible. But I had a different canvas the colors on my campus than he did in the sense of I knew what it was like to grow up with immigrant parents I knew what it was like to have a teacher treat me differently than my uh, white classmates um, and it didn't even have to be a white teacher I mean I remember at one point there was um, a teacher who was of a different cultural background who apparently just hated our cultural background you know and she didn't even know who I was and what I, what background I was until back to school night when my mom came in and had to go from class to class. And when she saw that my mom had an accent, she pulled me aside and asked me where I was originally from. And when she found out I was from a, originally from Afghanistan, it, she was originally from India. And, I'm, and a, I had a lot of Indian friends and I still do. So I didn't expect much about it, but I guess she was an older woman who equated Afghanistan and Muslims to um to the 
to the division that happened in India, which created Pakistan at the time. And I didn't know any of this stuff when I was in high school. Um, and I learned after she failed me, despite getting 100 on my test. And then as I took it to the guidance counselor and we dealt with that, I found out why she, she hated me again. It goes back to growing up different. So my husband didn't have that. He went to a Catholic school. He went to, he was, you know, strong white guy who played sport. His mother was a superintendent of Catholic schools. And I could see the world in a way that he couldn't. Um, and I think that in the last four years, a lot of people have now started to see that as well. I mean, I don't know if many of you saw the Saturday Night Live skit after the elections in 2016 where um, Dave Chappelle uh, was watching a election party with his white friends and the white friends were shocked that Trump won and Dave Chappelle and his friend were like, yeah, we saw that coming. Very interesting. We we do have some comments now regarding why people write. And one is from Marie. She says, I write to help people escape, but still tell a story that needs to be told. Um, one is from Cody. I want I would want individuals to feel empowered and motivated. And then Disha says, as someone said earlier, I write because I can be introverted and shy when introducing myself to others. Writing allows me to step past this personality barrier and connect with others on a deeper level. Um, I love that. Jeanette says, I love how you frame being a writer as being a facilitator of other others' voices and stories. Thank you. These are great. I love hearing this because it's also different. It's different for everyone, which is the beauty of it all as well. Right. And then um, Carter Bedford says, Chris Rock, great skit on SNL. Yes. And then actually there's another question that was posed earlier. Let me find it about um, advice from you regarding um, writing. So this is from Miranda on a side note. Mm -hmm. My husband was in the army and deployed to Iraq. I have encouraged him to write a story, but it has been too raw as of yet. When he's ready, what could I do to encourage him? Do you have any suggestions coming from someone who has seen many of the things he saw and has used writing as a way to heal? You know, that's a great question because in a couple slides from now, uh, I was going to touch on it, but I'll touch on it now. Um, writing can be therapy. Um, it can be such a great way to get it all out. Um, when I was writing my book on Afghanistan, I had just, I wrote some of it while I was still in Afghanistan, but I finished it while we had moved to Jerusalem. And I didn't know this at the time because you don't know it when you're going through it. Um, it was later that my husband told me that, yeah, you've changed a lot. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you don't wake up screaming anymore. Um, and, you know, I had PTSD. I didn't really think about it, but I guess you know, you, you try not to when you, when you're going through it. And I'm sure your husband saw a lot when he was a rock in Iraq, Iraq was a, a very gruesome, like war. It was a scary, scary place. I covered it myself as a journalist, but not to the extent that I covered Afghanistan. So I was there for probably a few months instead of a few years. Um, writing was my way of getting it out. Like it was a way of getting it out of my brain and putting it on paper. Um, if he can just sit down and you can even tell him he doesn't have to share it, you know, just sit down for an hour a day and just put it on paper. It doesn't even have to be in order. Um, and I say this because I couldn't sit down and write it. And my husband kept telling me, just sit down, write it, write it in different orders, you know, and then if you want, you can put it together um, in different ways, put the pieces of the puzzle together. And who knows, you might just delete a lot of it anyway. Um, but the main thing is to just write whatever's on your mind at that moment. And, and I will also, uh, in my tips, I've written down, there's a application called Scrivener, which I prefer over Microsoft Word, 
um, which I was just recently introduced to towards the end of writing my second novel, because in Scrivener, you don't have to write in one order like you do on Microsoft Word. You can write it in different chapters. You can have different sections and you can write, I'm going to write about this now, or I'm going to write about what happened that day now. I'm going to write about what happened like three months later here. Um, I love that it's like a virtual cards so that you don't have to write it linearly, which exactly will really hang, hang you up as a writer. Um, such great advice. Thank you so much. And that's one thing that also helps with writer's block, I've noticed, is when you have that. Um, and you could easily pop from one to the other. So if you decide, oh, wait, let me add this to that, just you just click. You don't have to scroll up and try to find whatever page it was on. Wow, that's really helpful. And you have no, it has a place to do note cards and stories. And if you plot, you can plot. Um, it's, it's a, it's a great, I've written it at the end in tips, but it's called Scrivener. Um, you have to pay for it. It's actually cheaper than Microsoft Office. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, with your story ideas, just go with what you know, with what you're passionate about. You don't even have to know it. Just be passionate about it and learn about it. Um, you know, it could be about yourself. It could be about what happened to you growing up. It could be about an experience you had, like your husband in Iraq. Um, it could be your own experience with your husband coming back from Iraq. Um, or while he was away, what life was like and worry. Um, there's more than just the one story. You know, it's the story of the families that are left behind, left to worry. It's sometimes easier being the one to leave than it is being the one to worry um, I noticed that as myself before I was a mother, um, I, I knew my parents would get scared when I'd leave to go places. I remember when I told my mom I was going to Baghdad, she didn't tell me not to go. She did cry and she, on the phone and she said, I know this is what you wanted. Um, as a mother now I get scared sending my son to school. So I'm like, right. I can understand that. Uh, especially since, you know, living abroad, you didn't really have to deal with school shootings. Now we're back in America and I get scared and I'm like, okay, well now I know what it's like to be the one to be afraid. But when you're the one doing it, it's just less fearful. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, write about people you meet, people that have inspired you. Um, we're all unique. I mean, there's, you could think that you're the blandest person in the world and you're not. You know, you have unique experiences that that make up who you are, that make up the town that you live in. Um, what you might think is bland is something that someone else has never experienced before, um, which is which is something that people think about. I mean, I grew up obviously not having diverse books, but it was really cool to kind of escape and figure out what 19th century log cabin America was like. Um, mm -hmm. I still read it and I loved it. Um, and another thing is, is we shouldn't just complain about marginalization. You know, we should write about it, write about what you want people to know. Just if we're complaining about people don't know about this, people don't know about this, write about it, write about it. Be the one to tell them, um, be the one to, be the one to tell them with your own words. Um, and do it also without tearing others down in order to lift yourself up. Um, you know, we should not use our writing to tear other people down um, in order to make ourselves seem higher. Mm -hmm. Writing should be about connecting us. I really love that you said that. And, and writing often is a process by which you figure out what you think and feel as well. Um, you may think you know what you think until you start to write and then explore and continue that research process for your own development as you're writing. So um, that's a really, really good tip. So we do have a comment that says, my partner is an army vet who served in Baghdad. My ex is an Egyptian Muslim. Having both perspectives is so interesting to me. Wow. Wow. That is a, <laughs> that's a, that's even more interesting than my, my matron of honor. Her first husband was um, from a Mexican immigrant family in Watts. Uh, and her current husband is a 
Trump supporting Oklahoman who uh, she moved. So she moved to California to be with her first husband. And now she's moved to Oklahoma to be with her second husband. And um, it's just too, like, he's anti-immigration. Her mm-hmm. first husband was an immigrant. And it's just, for me, I'm like, how, how does that happen? So it's, it's cool to have both perspective of Egyptian Muslim and an army vet. That's two different worlds. And that's awesome. Yeah, how enriching. Yeah. Um, we've got something else that says, how do you get others to trust your experience if um, they have never seen it or been through it? And that's, that's the key there is you, it's your responsibility um, in the sense of, they're going to trust you. A lot of these readers are going to trust you. Some may not trust you and you're giving them the truth, but your responsibility to be is to be as truthful and as real as possible to your subjects and to your readers. Because when people pick up your word, and that's why I said be impeccable with your word, just be very, very impeccable with everything that you write. Because some people will take it as the complete and utter truth. So that's why you should try to keep it as true as possible to the story that you're writing. And one person's truth is going to be completely different from someone else's. I know that my book about Syrian refugees could be completely different from another Syrian story about leaving Syria and becoming a refugee. But I know that my book is the story of many people, um, the people that I spoke with. So you can't control what they trust and don't trust, but you can control yourself and your writing and and how you're honest with yourself. Um, so that's my advice on that. Um, it's let it stress you out because once it lets once you stress out about it, that means you're doing something right. That means that you care enough about the story that you want to get it as accurate as possible. Mm, I love that. Yes. I think it was uh, Aretha Franklin who said that once she's not nervous to get up on the stage is the minute she knows she needs to get off the stage because she realizes she doesn't care anymore. Um, Exactly. So yes, caring about what you're writing about will inspire you to do the research and the work required to tell your truth. Very Mm -hmm. great advice. Thank you. Thank you. And it goes back to critiques, handling critiques, handling people that, again, are going to love and hate it. Um, I was, one of my biggest points when I tried to tell people about Atlanta Permanent Goodbyes is that it was featured on NPR, Morning Edition, and it was featured on Fox News with Dana Perino. Um, It was, it was really interesting when first Dana Perino, the first thing she did was she put it on Instagram and then she put it on the show, The Five. Um, and a lot of people who would not have picked up a book about refugees picked up a book about refugees. And the book has gotten several starred reviews. Um, it's gotten really good feedback on Goodreads. Um, but one of my favorites was this tweet from this woman. And just she just said to me, And she read it because Dana Perino, Fox News, suggested it. I just read your book. My view on refugees has changed. That was huge to me because I know how much of an anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment is out there. Um, And what what I appreciate about my book, I should say, is that it not only opens the minds up for people on refugees, it also opens their minds up about immigrants. You know, a Syrian refugee is no different from an immigrant crossing the border um, into America. These are human beings who are looking for survival. They're looking to make their lives and their family lives better. And if, if they can be humanized to people who would not humanize them otherwise, and if the book reached just one person, it makes a difference to me. And if your book can do that, even with one person, it's worth all the stress. It really is because it's about changing hearts one at a time. You know, there are those people who have turned to 
turn to hate rather than to love. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more of that since 2016. And we're seeing a lot of people writing hateful things on the internet and a lot of people choosing to read those hateful things because it coincides with their fears and with their fears and hate and makes them feel stronger when other people feel the same way. Uh, we could do the same thing the other way around. Um, and that's what I think is, is important when it comes to writing. Um, but have a thick skin because there are going to be people who hate it. There are going to be a lot of people who hate it. Um, it's, it, you know, I come from an interfaith family in the sense of my husband and I are two different religions. Um, we have been threatened because we were both in the spotlight in the sense of in the news. Uh, I had been threatened to be beheaded in the past. Um, my... <laughs> My poor mother-in-law, who was the head of Catholic schools, superintendent of Catholic schools in our area, in the D.C. area, then retired from there to work at the Bishop's Council. You know, they had a conspiracy from the, I guess, alt-right global movement, and they sent someone to her church. Uh, they flew him in, and they sent someone to have dinner with people that they knew, and they've said that she is a closet Al-Qaeda who has infiltrated the church, the Catholic church. I mean, there are going to be crazy people all the time. Um, but you know what? They're out there. You might get canceled. You might pop right back up. It's, it is what it is. Go back into writing as therapy. We talked on this, you know, for me, the secret sky helped get out that four and a half years in my heart and head about Afghanistan. Alana Pern McBuys was my way to write about um, what I was seeing on television. I'm holding my child in my warm apartment in Jerusalem while I'm watching these mothers pushing those strollers in the cold highways, thinking about my own mother. And then I had to write the book. I had to get it out. Um, Sally Ride, my book, It's Not Fiction but it was my way of contributing to what's, to raising my own kids. Uh, I want my daughter to have these strong figures to look up to. I want my son even more so than my daughter to realize that there are women and we have to make them feel that they can do anything. We have to let the boys know that women can do anything. Um, and it's starting them young. So this was my therapy in that sense. Um, going to the tips, <coughs> read. You want to be a good writer? Read, read, read. Write, write, write. Um, do what feels right for you. Um, if it feels right for you, that's a good thing. Even if it feels right for you, it might not be right for someone else and understand that. Um, if you can plot, I cannot plot. Um, I wish to God that I could because it would make writing so much easier and flow better. Um, I write, as this quote says, writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can you can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make it the whole trip that way. That's how I write my books. Um, I wish I could plot, but that's just the way it is. Um, take people's advice, ignore people's advice. People have their own minds. Again, go back to what's feeling right. And the writing tools, I, again, Again, suggest Scrivener if you're not a linear person like myself. Um, and the inspirations, we've already talked about this as well, it can come from anywhere. Um, the Secret Sky came from Afghanistan, a land of permanent goodbyes came from my refugee background. Um, before we finish this off, I just want to leave you with one quote. And this is what I, the quote I start my book with, and it's from Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. Um, when I was a boy, and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words, and I'm always comforted by realizing there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in this world. I would like you to always remember the helpers, and I would always encourage you to be that helper for others. Um, and we can do that in our writing as well. And that's it for the slides, if there's any questions. Thank you so much. That I love that quote. Um, yes, there are some questions. So one is, have you been canceled? And if so, how do you respond to that? 
what are your, if you have any tips to helping yourself minimize the stress and internalizing that criticism? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't I'm, I'm sure I have been canceled and I don't know about it. I'm not important enough, <laughs> but, um, but I've had the stress of people coming after me and coming after uh, my family um, because of our backgrounds. Um, and it has it, it had more to do with journalism than it did with, um, with my books that I wrote. And it's, it's learning to just move on and accepting the fact that there are going to be people who dislike you and even hate you. Um, but that's a part of life. And, and sometimes it's on a bigger scale than we'd like and a scarier scale than we'd like. I mean, my life has been threatened on various occasions um, and it's not fun. Uh, and one time it happened in Afghanistan by the producer who was sitting next to me in the own house that I was living in. That's a story for another day. But um, I would sleep at night with a knife underneath my pillow because I was scared. But that's a way that people use to try to shut you up, is to try to scare you in fear. Um, and if we let them win, they've won. So you just have to keep persisting. Thank you. And I actually have a question for you regarding uh, youth voices. So you've written your novels uh, for youth readers. Of course, they do extend to adult readers. But what kind of advice would you give to our six-year-old writers and our 10-year-old writers and our 14-year-old writers? They honestly have the minds that I wish that we had. So write just write, keep writing. And when you continue to write, your writing becomes stronger and you get your emotions out in a way that I myself is, am disconnected to that age by many years. I'd like to think that I still have the mindset of my youth, but there are things that young kids and teenage kids think about that we don't anymore. And I see that in my own children. Like my son will see something that I haven't seen. And then when he shows it to me, like yesterday, the bath, the water was going down. And he was like, look at the water tornado. And I came and it's something that I remember as a child noticing and loving. And as an adult, I haven't seen it anymore. So children, young writers can give us a perspective that we've completely forgot. And it, Oftentimes, it's a much more beautiful perspective. So I totally encourage young writers to keep writing and put it out there because I have no doubt there's going to be a lot of more younger and younger authors that are going to be published soon. I love it. I love it. May we all see the water tornadoes in our own lives. Um, so at this time, I do not see any additional questions. Did you have anything else you wanted to end with, Matia? Just a huge thank you to everyone for listening to me. I'm sorry if I may have droned on. I'm sorry if I have offended anyone because I'm sure some people don't agree with everything that I've said. Um, and thank you for everyone who made this possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. I do not think you droned on at all. It was very insightful and helpful. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. So later today, we will have several breakout sessions, and this will we'll continue the conversations that we've started this morning. And you can visit a tiny URL. So I think Jeanette's going to put the URL in the chat um, so that we have the correct one for you all to use and bounce off of. Um, we hope to see you this afternoon. Thank you so much again, Atia, and um, thank you to our participants.